dead for five years, but his life force in the University of Berlin remained wholly undimmed. Marx was profoundly influenced, an influence that would last for his lifetime. Hegel is not easy for the Anglo-Saxon or American mind. My feeling for his ideas, I confess, has always been a little insecure. What Hegel called the dialectic was the enduring conflict by which man achieves liberation and perfection, a life ruled by reason. The conflict is between opposites, theses and antithesis, leading to a new synthesis. Thus, from the conflict between savagery and law comes freedom, the new synthesis. But freedom as the new synthesis nurtures new conflicts. History is this process of constant transformation. But it is an optimistic transformation, one that yields eventually the perfect state. Hegel thought the Prussian state of his time came close to that perfection. This was a thought that Marx strongly rejected. For him, the Hegelian transformation had far to go. Modern Marxists are better satisfied with one part of modern Germany, East Germany, East Berlin. How Marx would react to this as a final stage, as perfection, is much less certain. In his own time, and most of all in Germany, he saw the Hegelian process as highly incomplete. The capitalist synthesis was nurturing the forces that would bring the next conflict to further synthesis. That synthesis for Marx would, of course, be socialism. For Marxists, viewing the modern socialist states, watching the May Day Parade here in East Berlin, it makes for a very interesting question. Has the Hegelian process stopped? Is it still continuing? Does socialist discipline produce an intellectual antithesis? Does it make scientists, poets, artists, writers, intellectuals into the new antagonistic class? It's a highly pregnant thought to which Marx, if he returned, might well be open. Most modern Marxists are content to have the Hegelian process come to an end with the present state of socialism and its discipline. Neither Hegel nor Marx should be carried to inconvenient extremes. In 1841, Marx left Berlin. He would henceforth himself be a part of the Hegelian process, one of the great instruments of its transformation. He went soon to Cologne, like Trier, also recently redeemed from France, and more liberal for the experience. In France, what wasn't prohibited was permitted, but in Prussia, what wasn't permitted was prohibited. In this environment, Marx became a journalist, and he was an immediate success. He was a good journalist, careful, intelligent, intense. His language was varied and resourceful, with much indication of the solid power to come. The Rheinische Zeitung was being financed by the rising industrialists of the Rhine and the Ruhr. For them, Marx was a force for progress, an apostle of the modern economic world, liberalism, freedom of enterprise, if that was the choice, as opposed to the dead hand of feudalism, with all its restrictions and restraints. They soon made him editor. He was also a force for moderation. The word communism, though still indistinct as to meaning, was now coming into use. Marx describes some of the contributions to his newspaper. Scrawls, pregnant with world revolution and empty of thought, written in slovenly style and flavored with some atheism and communism, which these gentlemen have never studied. I declared that I considered the smuggling of uh, communist and socialist ideas into casual theater reviews was unsuitable, indeed, immoral. Marx 
quite possibly should be brought back to deal with some modern radical literature. Under Marx, the paper grew in circulation and in influence over Germany and in interest to the censors who thoughtfully reviewed the proofs of each issue each night before it went to press. They were constantly disturbed, but especially by Marx on dead wood. Wood was a metaphor of Marx's thought of the time. Anciently, the people of the Rhineland had gone to the forest for firewood. Now wood had become valuable, and the right was withdrawn. Public property had become private property. David McClellan, to whose fine biography of Marx I'm very much indebted, tells how the cases against wood and against the wood collectors clogged the courts at the time. Marx thought private property ought to be defended with some discretion. If every violation of property, without distinction or more precise determination, is theft, would not all private property be theft? Through my private property, do not I deprive another person of this property? In these same months of 1842, Marx came to the support of old neighbors, the wine growers of the Mosel Valley. They were suffering severely from competition under the Sulfurine, the common market that the German states had recently adopted. Again, no one will think his solution extreme. To resolve the difficulty, the administration and the administered both need a third element, which is political without being official and bureaucratic. An element which at the same time represents the citizen without being directly involved in private interests. Now this resolving element, composed of a political mind and a civic heart, is a free press. So there was Marx, the defender of freedom of the press. He also, in his columns, criticized the Russian Tsar and urged a more secular approach to divorce. Obviously, this sort of thing could not go on. In March 1843, the Prussian government cracked down, suppressed the paper. Physically, Marx's German years were now over. In spirit, he would return to Germany again and again. Wherever Marx might be, his thoughts would return to the land of his birth and of his education. And before leaving this time, he forged a new tie. He went to Kruznach and married Jenny. A little earlier, she had written to urge him, come what may, to keep clear of politics. That was indeed a slender hope. By autumn, Marx and Jenny were in Paris, at the very center of the political life and debate of the age. Here all that was new began, or so anyhow it seemed. The Great Revolution was only 50 years in the past, that of 1831, only 12 years before, and that of 1848, less than five years ahead. The streets of Paris were full of refugees from Prussian censorship and repression, and many were young revolutionaries as now. Marx and his wife lived here on the left bank in the Rue Veneau. The Marx family lived at several addresses along this street for the longest time here at number 38. Once he was settled here in Paris, Marx got ahead with his next journalistic enterprise, the editing of the Deutsch Französische Jahrbücher, the German-French yearbooks, really a magazine. By calling it a book, he hoped to avoid censorship. The reference to France in the title uh, was a gesture. Though he was here in Paris, Marx's thoughts at this time were almost wholly on Germany. In France, every class of the people is politically idealistic and is not primarily conscious of itself as a particular class, but as a representative of general social needs. The proletariat is only beginning to exist in Germany uh, through the invasion of the industrial movement. Thus, we are now starting to begin in Germany when France and England are beginning to end. When all interior conditions are fulfilled, the day of German resurrection will be heralded <laughs> by the crowing of the Gallic cock. By January 1842, 